daddy. Okay, take it from where you stop. We believe you've been led by this temple. For inquiries, please call plus two three three two six seven six seven. This is five five plus two three three two six seven six seven. This is five five. Or send an email to info at godswearforus.com. Info at godswearforus.com. For the privilege again to share fellowship, Lord, we ask that even tonight, this great day of fellowship, of intimacy, you would open our understanding to receive of your word, and Lord, cause us by the strength of that which you would teach us today to make the right decisions and to stem into a most profitable and impactful life. Take all the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I want to specially, before you sit down, because it's a marriage seminar, I had to come with my wife. <laughs> <You know? laughs> the kind of ministry some of us run is quite hectic. So you need a special calling to do it. So I don't go everywhere with her. But this one was necessary. She's a busy person, but... Um, can you please celebrate my wife? <laughs> Part of the things I'll be sharing today is some of the things I'm enjoying because I'm, I'm married by the Spirit. God help me. <laughs> and I believe somebody will marry correctly. In the name of Jesus. Mrs. Osenaga Oropo is here. Thank you so much. <laughs> you may be seated. God bless you. Pardon my bias. Or saluting her last. 
Today is a special day and um, the subject we want to deal with is a very sensitive subject. I did a series on marriage and um, when I, I had the prompting to do that series, I had to do a bit of research and I was shocked. The level of the percentage divorce that is recorded is alarming all across the world. My friend and brother, Apostle Lawa Suleiman and his wife, it's good to have you. The percentage of divorce that I saw made me to truly believe that the marriage institution is under serious attack and is across the nations of the world. When you leave this seminar, you can go online and just type type divorce. You will see the percentage across different nations. It will humble you. And so when you are approaching the issue of marriage, you will approach it with fear and trembling. You will know that the subject matter is deeper than emotions. Because the crisis we have in approaching this sensitive topic is the fact that we approach it from the emotional realm and we don't know that the foundation of marriage is deeply rooted in the spirit and every spirit in the realm is interested in the marriage institution this is one of the most spiritual subject you will find in scripture it's as deep as prayer and if you miss this a lot of things will go wrong and so I'm going to approach it. Thank God when I saw the topic, I said, you are truly a coach. When I saw the mysteries of marriage, I know you wanted us to discuss at a deeper plane. And as I begin to share, you understand what I mean. Let me not take too, too much of our time to do preamble. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 and 32. We are going to look at the mysteries the mysteries of this institution called marriage you would understand why spirits are interested in marriage and you'd understand the parameters to consider when you want to venture into this college are we projecting anywhere okay we, we can read Ephesians 5 verse 30, 31 and 32 I take it I'll just read a few scriptures I wish we were projecting it would have been faster, but it's good. Oh, perfect. He said, for this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. I will talk about that reason. It's one of the mysteries, so I don't want to begin with it. The reason that necessitated that statement. And it's on the strength of that reason that two can become one. Now, the possibility of two becoming one is a mystery that can only be traced to the foundation of the Godhead. That's where you find the Trinity. And there's something about it that we'll look at. We'll excavate as we begin to study. In verse 32, he said, This is a great mystery. And he said, But I speak concerning Christ and the church. So it's time... The subject of marriage and the union that exists between a man and a wife to the relationship that exists between Christ and the church. If you understand the relationship that exists between Christ and the church, the ancient nature of that relationship, the powers locked in, in it, and the, the extent of its significance to God's agenda, it will begin to help you to understand what marriage is about. So marriage is as significant to God as the church and Christ in relationship is to God. So this is not a subject you can deal with on the plane of emotion. The same way certain people come to church and it's based on, on, on emotion. That's how they approach marriage. You know, some people go to church because of the flamboyance, their LED screens, you find excellence, they are doing a lot of dancing, and they think church is a social organization where you just come to party with people, have some fun, you know, Saturdays, Sundays, is a social gathering. That's what they think church is. They don't know how, how mystical the union between the body and the Christ is. And it is that mentality they also go into marriage with. So they look at a young man who has broad chest, 
some very excellent physique. It's my own big at all. <laughs> they look at some excellent physique, or they look at a young lady who has some very good shapes, and they are they are carried away. They, as far as they are concerned, this is their future. This is their life partner. This thing is deeper than that. And so we are going to look at it. But before I talk about the mysteries, let me show you the nature of mysteries so that you understand the plane that will have this discussion. Because many times when you discuss sensitive subjects like this, they carry it and put the internet. And they want to discuss it among people who don't have an iota of knowledge as touching the foundation of the reality being discussed. And so they are discussing it from the plane of human knowledge. And they think what you are talking about is a conversation that two intellectuals can have. There are certain conversations that are not meant for intellectuals. They are meant for the spiritual. And so if you are not spiritual, no matter how intellectually inclined you are, you will be a novice on those corridors. Marriage is one of such conversations. Now, because he said marriage is a great mystery, and I, I wish I had time to show you the seven mysteries of the Bible. What the Bible calls mysteries in scripture. Like the mystery of iniquity. That's the depth that they are considering this subject from. The mystery. How sin enters the soul of a man. And how a man suddenly discovers that he can no longer use his will to do what is right. Because something is at work in him. He will cry. He will beat himself. But he will still go back. Because what is happening to him is beyond his mind. It's beyond his willpower. It's called the mystery of iniquity. It's a power that engenders lawlessness. And until the law of the spirit of life is activated, he cannot deal with that issue. So, no matter how intellectually inclined you are, you can't find the fight iniquity with your brain. You can't fight iniquity with your, your emotions. So, when we are dealing with the subject of sin, be this not a credential that brings you to that table. That's how marriage also is a deep mystery in the kingdom. But for us to understand the nature of mysteries so that we can have a proper conversation tonight because I want to speak boldly. I will say some things that will, will affect you but it's the truth. And I will say it the way it is. And I will not apologize. So let me say it before I start. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 2. Let's look at the nature of mysteries. The nature. First Corinthians chapter 2. From verse 6. It was I sent to that said mysteries of marriage. I'm not the one. So pardon me. He said, however, we speak wisdom among them who are mature. He said, yet, not the wisdom of this age. So... When we are talking mysteries, one thing you need to understand is that it's a reality that is not of this age. It's an economy that is for the ages to come. But God wants us to have a foretaste of what that reality is. That's why he is allowing us to taste of it. So what we are discussing here is something that you will understand its fullness in the age to come. So Paul is saying, when we are talking wisdom, and this wisdom we are going to see that is the mysteries of God. He said, it is amongst them that are mature. So if you are not spiritually mature, you can't understand it. Because this wisdom is not for this age. And he said, this wisdom is so deep that even the princes of darkness, who are spirits, they are not permitted to know it. Because they can only be revealed to them who are in Christ and them who, has, who have accepted the verdicts of the spirit that brings one into maturity. So it's a subject that is for the mature. And this subject is not for this age. We are only permitted to taste of it. And this subject is so mystical that even the princes in darkness can't understand it. That's why they want to destroy it. So if we are dealing with a subject that the Bible calls mystery, you need to have it at the back of your mind. That is not a subject for earth. We are only permitted to taste of it because we have the Holy Ghost. Number two, you need to understand that it is only for the mature. It's not for everybody. You may be walking in the reality, but you may not understand it. So there are many who are married today, they think it's an earthly thing. The foundation is in the world beyond us. And until you are mature in the spirit, you won't know the weight 
of that spiritual enterprise and is letting you know that even spirits that are not in God cannot understand it because this thing is a mystery that's why Paul went down to verse 12 he said we have not received the spirit that is of this world he said that we may know the things that are freely given to us by God he said which things we speak not with words that human wisdom teaches he said but with words that the Holy Ghost teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual he said for the natural man Receiveth not the things of the spirit of God Because they are foolishness unto him So some of the things I'll be saying here Will be foolish to the natural man He said neither can he know them Because they are spiritually designed So if your spirit is not alive To receive the things of God You will kick it out But when you get to heaven You will discover the true texture of the subject That what you were allowed to participate in on earth Actually has a deeper meaning In the heavenlies and so it's something that will affect you for all eternity. Having established that foundation, I have the liberty to talk about the mysteries of marriage. But let me leave you a disclaimer. We can also discuss marriage from the soulish and the emotional realm. Because we are intellectual beings. We are emotional beings. We are psychological beings. So what I'm about to teach now does not in any way undermine or kick out of the window. The aspects of marriage that deals with psychology, that deals with emotion. That is also included because the lesser is always included in the greater. But the subject we are considering this evening or this afternoon is the mystical aspect or the foundational aspects of marriage. The things that God considers and the reason why God is a part of it. Because when you go to the altar, it's not just you and your wife. It is you, your wife, and the Holy Spirit. So the reason why God is part of this institution is what we want to consider here. And you are going to see that the things we consider here will be deeper and stronger than what you feel. You know, in the Western world today, and even in Africa, people wake up and they say they are tired. They say they don't feel like it anymore. The Spirit is not involved because of your feeling. So as far as it's concerned, there's no arrangement like you becoming tired. There's no arrangement like you don't feel like anymore. Because when he entered the transaction, he didn't enter because you felt anything. It is good for you to feel something for the man. It's good for you to feel something for the woman. That is for you who are earthlings. He is coming from a realm yonder. And he doesn't operate from that realm based on emotion. So you can keep your emotions, you can service your emotions, and that's why I salute those who teach people how to service emotion in marriage. It's very important. But you need to understand that in case that emotion is no longer there, marriage continues. Because the reason the Holy Ghost became part of it is not because of your emotions. In the Western world today, when people wake, they wake up and they say, I don't have affection for him anymore. And because they don't have affection anymore, they go and divorce. You are a joker. If you think a spirit that is ancient like the Holy Ghost will come and become part of something and commit himself on the strength of your feelings, you don't know what you are talking about. So there are psychological aspects, there are emotional aspects, there are bodily aspects. In fact, when we are doing marriage counseling, we deal with subjects like expectations in marriage, we deal with subjects like intimacy, we deal with subjects like children and parenting we deal with subjects like communication we deal with subjects like conflict resolution we deal with subjects like personal growth and you know strategies we deal with subjects like dealing with extended families we deal with subjects you know like ethics codes of conduct all of those things we deal with them when we are doing counseling but the mysteries of marriage are deeper than that so this particular meeting is not for such so i'm not going to tell you how to communicate with the person I'm trying to leave a disclaimer. I'm not going to tell you how to dress well to win the affection of your husband. It's important for marriage counseling. When we finish here, we can go to marriage counseling. Here, we want to know why marriage is important to God. Why when you enter, you come back out. And why you have to take caution before you enter. So if you understand this, you will not marry somebody because he's tall. If you understand this, you will not marry somebody because she's dark. If you understand this, you will not marry somebody just because you have emotion. When you understand this, you are going to check deeper things, deeper parameters. 
not neglecting these other ones but you are going to what check deeper parameters so what are the mysteries that undergird this institution called marriage number one the reason god instituted marriage is because marriage is a spiritual gateway for transferring inheritances and ordinations In Genesis chapter 2 from verse 7 God revealed the only technology That is available in the spirit For imparting life Genesis 2 7 No other angel knew any other way By which life can be imparted The only way life can be transferred Is when God breathes That's all angels knew When God is creating any being what he does is that he breathes into that being and life enters that being and so in the college of angels when you ask them how is life transferred they tell you it is transferred through the breath of god so if god does not breathe into you there's no way you can be animated now when god created the earth realm and he wanted to secure his agenda on the earth there was need for his program to be transferred from one generation to another generation and so God needed a new technology of communicating life, not just through his breath anymore. So that as his agenda is being transmitted, because his agenda runs within the economy of life, let there be another channel by which life can be communicated so that his agenda can be transferred. And so when God created the man, he breathed into the man because that was the standard procedure of imparting life. Now, all of a sudden, he now discovers if this man needs to transfer this thing and multiply the earth i won't be able to come every day to keep breathing and keep breathing so what i need to do is to establish an institution through which i don't have to breathe but life will still continue so what he did was that he said it's not good for the man to be alone he now entered into the man brought out a rib and formed the woman and from there he created another channel by which life can be communicated so it is through the gateway of marriage that life can be transferred without God breathing. So when God wants to create another Adam, God will not go to the dust. He won't need to go into the rib. There is something that can happen between the Adam and the Eve that can produce another life that will be exactly like the first Adam. On the strength of that, Adam can be multiplied and God's agenda can be multiplied. So the first purpose of marriage from the realm of God is for procreation to take place. And in the course of procreation, God's agenda can be transmitted. This is why we, is this person part of your agenda for my life? Because the reason that union will hold a place with God is because there is a heritage that should be transferred. There is an agenda that should be transferred. But you see, today, people don't care about divine agenda anymore. Well, so in fact, there are places where people get married and they say, we don't want children. We just want to love ourselves, live together, and keep ourselves company. Because they think it's all about their emotions. They think it's all about their selves. And so when emotion is no longer working, they cut off and look for another person that they can breed emotion. But when God was creating this institution, he wanted a channel through which he can transfer agenda. He can transfer purpose. He can transfer ordination. And the only way ordination can be transferred is if life keeps being replicated. And marriage became one of the bases through which God can keep replicating life. The reason Jesus can be traced to Abraham is marriage. Now, if Adam did not have the capacity to procreate, then Jesus would have appeared on the street and say, I am Jesus. All of us were wrong. But the reason Jesus did not appear was because God kept marking that track. And God kept watching that lineage. And he watched it from Adam. Watched it through Abraham. Watched it through David. Watched it until he came to Joseph. God marked one bloodline from the foundation of the earth until the day Jesus came. So, so long as that gene keeps transferring, there's a possibility for a, a, a divine project to be executed. And that's how it is for every one of us. Everyone who is here today, there was an agenda. And if you go into God's structure in the spirit, 
there are dimensions that can travel through certain or the through bloodlines. There are dimensions that can travel through certain lineages. That's why even in the Israeli tribe, there is the Judah tribe that can handle scepters. It's not everybody who came out of Jacob that can be a king. It is a Judah that can be a king. And then you have the Issachar that have the right to the prophetic so that they can give direction to Israel. Because there are certain ordinations that are tied to bloodlines. So what God does is that when the time comes for that ordination to be transferred to the next generation, God comes upon you and puts a government. That now you are about to transfer my ordination to the next dispensation. You can't just marry anybody. Because there are people you marry who don't have that spiritual genetic structure to be able to host a dimension. And so you may love them, but if you marry them, you will truncate a possibility. If you marry them, you will shut down a spiritual operation. If you marry them, you will cancel out an agenda. So although God respects your feeling, God will give you a choice. If you want the prophetic to continue in this lineage, you will have to let go of your emotion. Because I am writing a prophetic code. And that code passes through your DNA. And because that code passes through your DNA, there are sacrifices you must make if this lineage must continue. So when you want to marry as a king, Kingdom agent, you will have respect for ordination, not feeling. You know, feelings can be built, but ordinations are eternal. They were crystallized from the studios of heaven. You don't have the power to create ordination. Only God has such powers. And so what God will do is that he will ensure that the right combinations come together. And it's not just about the gene. Because in Christ, we no longer function by biological gene. It's also about the capacity through process, capacity, through training, to be able to raise that child in the way of the Lord. So Proverbs 22 verse 6 said, train up a child in the way that he should go. You will read it and think it's about good character. He's not talking about good character. In the way that he should go means, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. I ordained you to be a prophet. So there are certain persons that have been trained with the capacity to raise prophets. So when you want to marry a woman who does not have the orientation to raise a prophet and it is destined upon you to produce prophet, God will say no. Because if you marry that woman, the child will not go in the way that she should go. Because the utensils for equipping is not with her. She was raised in a family where people do what they want. Everybody is a harlot, my brother. Even if she repents, the skill, the, the cap is not there. And so when God considers ordination, he will tell you, your loins, the seed of your loins were numbered from eternity. If there's one sacrifice you will make on earth, is to marry somebody who can steward it. You know, when he met Jeremiah, Jeremiah thought he was being creative. He said, no, ordinations are not creativity. He said, before you were formed, your mother's womb, I knew you. I was the one who occasioned the bonding process that resulted in you. And the reason I occasioned it is so that they will have enough skill to teach you how to access God and walk in your ordination. Did you not read about the patriarchs? Before anybody came, they had encounters. In Luke chapter 1, from verse 13 to verse 17, the Bible said Zacharias went into the court to prepare for the service. And while he stood, the angel appeared to him and told him, Zacharias. <laughs> Look at verse 13. Let me show you some scriptures. You know, when we, we, when we talk marriage, people think it's emotion. Emotion is secondary. We are talking ordination. There are certain hands that must be on deck for a prophet to be born. For an, for an apostle to be born. For a king to be born. There are certain hands. There are certain trainings. From when the child is infant, you need a woman and a man who have the skill to talk life into that child. So that mindsets can be formed. Is it this generation where people wake up with Twitter and sleep with Twitter that you will just marry carelessly? Meanwhile, you need a mother that when the child, when she was, she's still pregnant, she knows when there are movements in her stomach. So in the evening, she can put her hand and begin to shape the destiny of that child from the womb. That's, that's the kind of woman God needs for the ordination that was written through you. And then you say, no, I, I, somebody is dark and short. When your child is one, there are wars he needs to hear to modify his DNA so that he can align with divine ordinance. 
and you need a woman that has the requisite capacity, the patience, and the spiritual intelligence to keep dishing those walls, dishing those walls, so that when that child is seven, he will have the capacity to have his first encounter. Because encounters were written that at the age of seven he will have encounter, but he needs discernment, and he doesn't have the ability to read a book. Is the mother that will read books and talk it into his spirit so that his senses will be sharp to pick the movement of the angel at seven. But you see, you now married a mother that is a Twitter expert. So even when that child is 20, he has not been able to build sensitivity because they, he was not trained in the way that he should go. <laughs> I come in the volume of the books. It was written about me <laughs> to do your will, oh God. I come in the volume. Rakibo Asalata Bararana Mandadira Kai. We can't charge yet. Wait. Look at this scripture. Please sit down. He said, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias. He said, For thy prayers is heard. Because there are certain children that won't come until you have raised prayers. You need prayers. So it's not like you are, it's not that you are barren. You need prayers because you need a spiritual womb to carry that child. So God can wait for five years. If the person, the man you married, is not a spiritual man, he will tell you, I'm the only son. My, my, my people need a male child. Meanwhile, what they are saying is that you need a womb that is incubated with priesthood to be able to raise this king in the spirit. But the man is under pressure because his grandfather said they need a boy. And because of that, after five years, the man will come to you and say, you see, we have tried. It's not working. So I've decided to take a second wife. Meanwhile, it was designed that a child will come only after five years because you need enough incubation. He says, Zacharias, he says, your prayers have been heard. He said, thy wife, because even your wife, they know her in the spirit. Thy wife, Elizabeth, shall be with bear thee a son, and you shall call his name John. So you don't give names because you heard, you watch a movie, and you love Nick. So many people who should bear Smith are bearing Bartholomew. People who should be a poor are bearing Nathaniel because they don't even know that even the name carries the signature of the ordination. But how, how can they pick it? They, when they married from emotion, he shall bear the son. His name shall be called John. Do you know the, the dramatic part of this story? He doubted the angel and he became dumb. So he didn't have the opportunity to tell Elizabeth. But the day the child was supposed to be named, elders came. Who thought that children is about this is our lineage, this is our clan? And they started suggesting that the child's name should be Zacharias. Elizabeth stood up and said, No, his name is John. They said, No, 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 nobody in this lineage has borne that name before. He said, No, his name is John. It was why they were arguing that the mouth of Zachariah opened and he said, Yes, his name is John. That means Elizabeth was not where this encounter happened. But she had the signature. She too could peep into the destiny of the child. So the reason they qualify to be husband and wife is because both of them can read the destiny of the children that they born. The reason John became a great prophet was because they married correctly. I was preaching in Zambia when God told me my first son would be called Moses. I, I wrote it down and left. One month to the time, my wife now was suggesting to me in reverence what I think about the name Moses. I said, why you say Moses? She said, that's what she heard. I said, now I know you are qualified to be a mother. Because one of the signs that I married correctly is the fact that she was able to pick it. So now, even if I leave my son for my wife alone for 10 years, I won't be afraid. He can fulfill his destiny because she had the power to see and to hear on matters of his ordination. Go and read the Bible. You will find out that all the most of the great men that the Bible took time to write, their mothers had encounters in the spirit. From Samuel, there was an encounter. To Samson, there was an encounter. 
and that's how it continues. So the reason they are able to steward those destinies and to bed those giants was because they knew their ordination. And so you meet a man who has no power in the spirit. You meet a woman who has no power in the spirit. You are marrying because of sheep. It may take another 50 to 100 years before God visits that bloodline again. That's why you come to certain families, darkness will rule for 80 years. Darkness will rule for 100 years because there are no stewards. There are no custodians. Too many dislocations happen. And it will take God 100 years again to begin to connect the, the clan. The clan. It will take time because maybe it is great grandchildren of different lines that God will finally go and connect again to realign the design of ordination. Ordinations are born through marriage. Divine heritages are preserved through marriage. That's the first mystery of marriage. And so when God created Adam and Eve, God knew that Jesus would come from there. And he will not just come from anyone. He will come through the one that bets Abraham. Through the one that bets David. And through the one that bets Joseph. Because Abraham represents father. David represents king. Jesus must be king and father. And for that to happen, the algorithm must be correct. If they fail, manipulations will happen until it's gotten right. And I wish I had time to show you some of the manipulation. I would have used the life of Judah alone to show you how a married gave birth. See, ordinations are dangerous things. They manifest the wisdoms of God. And one of the channels through which they are communicated is through marriage. See, next time somebody approaches you, don't be carried away by looks. Go and ask God, is this consistent with your plan? You know the reason why we water down the subject now and teach it based on feeling and psychology? It's because we know we are not raising spiritual men. We know we are not raising spiritual women. If we tell every member of the church today, marry by discernment, people will marry once in 10 years. Because we know the, the disciples we are raising, they don't hear God. If we, if we know we are raising people who hear God, who are, who, are, who are sensitive to the motions of life, it won't even be a topic to discuss. Because the lady will walk up to you and say, yes, that guy came to me, but when I checked, he was not God's plan. It won't be a topic to discuss. Everybody will pick frequencies. And if we begin to give birth like that, in a short period of time, we will take over the world. Don't you know that in most of the dark religions today, in places like India, you can't just throw up and say you want to marry. Who? Marry what? They will check the stars in the spirit through astrology. They will check to see if there is alignment. It is on the strength of the agreement of the stars. That's how they will choose even the date of the marriage. And then you are wondering why they are taking over the world. Because they understand the place of spirit on these matters. So when they give birth to children, they can tell you who is king. They can tell you who is prophet. They can tell you who is a businessman. Because they have checked that stars are last. And so they can pick the utterances of the spirit to know what their destinies represent. It's only in Christendom that people you throw up from out of the street and say, I love, love this person's hair. And you are marrying because of hair. Marrying because of leg. Marrying because of buttocks. Marrying because of chest. When God is looking at things that were scripted before the foundations of the world. Because we have raised Kana people who don't have spiritual sensitivity. If you want to get it right, and I'm not, this is not about happiness. You can marry a man who will take you to Bahamas all your life. But you will raise children that are godless. You will raise children that may end up as swindlers. You will raise children, even if they have money, they will not be relevant in God's agenda. Because there is a distortion in spiritual alignment. It was not consistent to divine plan. God knew why he put you in Africa. And if you are spiritual, everywhere you go will be orchestrated by God so that you will meet that person. That's how God works. When I leave this world, I will go and cry. Well, if you're already married, the one you have now is God's will. But those who are not yet married, <laughs> so don't hear me and say, Kai, 
Could it be that that sister God showed me and I rejected? Is that why I'm having problem in my house now? That problem has its purpose and I will show you. Anyone you have now, so long as you have gone to the altar, God designed this world such that he will respect your will. You have gone to the altar, that is now God's will for you. So build it by the help of the Holy Ghost, something can still come out of it. <laughs> I wish I had time to tell you my stories. Hmm. Oh, God of mercy. Thank God I married a beautiful wife. But <laughs> the Holy Ghost brought me to a place and I had to agree with him that even if he's a baboon, you show me, I will go ahead. I'm telling you, I'm on the altar, I'm telling you my dialogue with God. Because I had my own specs. You know this idea of hey, hey, marry, uh, see, there are lots of garbages. If you are a spiritual man and you want to fulfill God's purpose, you know there is the perfect will, there is the acceptable will and the good will. Many people will go to heaven with acceptable will. And then they will discover the disalignments they created because they allowed their emotions to lead their lives. Number two, mysteries. The second thing about marriage is where I began to read from. is the mystery of oneness. And I will show you how that mystery works and why God insists on that mystery. Now, the reason I started with the first is because if you miss one, the second one will be more difficult. Because God knows your ordination. Now, imagine me for example. God knew from the before I was born that I will travel and travel and travel and if I have time, in my house for one week it will be a blessing imagine if I went and married one fair baby robber lady who wants her husband to put hand on her shoulder put hand on her waist they are going to uh, shop together they are going for holiday together anywhere they are going they are going together I would have had problem from the first month that will never be resolved so the God who knew what he wrote about me prepared somebody that had stamina to endure my absence even for one month anytime God permits me to come I've come and anytime I'm not around is part of her destiny they taught her when she was a child that she will marry a man of God and that man of God will be all about the father's business so she grew with that mentality she grew with that mindset although she loves it when we are together But anytime I'm not around, I'm in the missions. Because I'm married to the Holy Ghost. Imagine if I married somebody who, 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 all her fantasy is that every day they will snap together, they will put online, they will... I'm not even the type of person that you'll see my personal life anywhere. Personal means personal. You will hardly, if you find anything about me anywhere that is personal... Somebody got it and put it there without my knowledge. And then you marry somebody who, even if she coughs, is on the internet. You will now be quarreling. They will now come and say, why are you quarreling? She will say, I cough. He didn't allow me to upload it. (laughs) Meanwhile, angels are warring in the spirit with demons. You are arguing that she didn't allow you to upload you hear issues that should not be a problem becoming problem because people are dislocated in the same home and they are stuck with themselves forever because they had no regard for ordination number two oneness Ephesians 5 let's read from verse 22 this time as you read it you are going to see the operational modality of the spirit that makes for oneness and you are going to see why God insists on oneness Because these are two things you need to get from here. And both of them are a mystery. First, how two can become one in the context of marriage. And then secondly, the power that two becoming one holds with God. You say, wives, submit. This is the word that they don't want to hear in the Western world. But every time we teach marriage, we hammer it and hammer it. And if you like, be pained. We are talking Bible. We are not talking human opinion. I've taught them before in, in my place. I told them 
a woman has four stages in life just like a man a woman begins a girl as a girl her glory is her body that's when she notices puberty she starts noticing peculiar shapes that were not there you know when when you are coming into the zenith of gearhood shapes begin to come out when all of you were five both boy and girl is the same we play ball together we drive tire ride tire together all of us are fighting we are fighting but when you start approaching 11 12 you can't go and play football with men again because shapes will distinguish you so the glory of a girl is her looks as she begins to grow a point will come when she needs to metamorphose from a gear to become a woman or a lady but the problem is that many don't migrate from girls to becoming ladies because when you become a lady your glory moves from your body to your mind because you are you have to be a helper someday so you need the intellectual capacity to contribute something and your society also needs your perspective in order to shape a complete world if this world was to be built by men alone it will be a world of soldiers only violence will be here and if this world were to be built by women alone it would have been a world of deception everything would have been subtlety and manipulation now for the, there must be a blend so that it's not all powerful and it's not all subtlety god decide to combine it so a woman has something to add to family and to society so as she grows from a gear to a lady she develops her mind that's why every wise father spends money to raise a child if you meet a man who thinks being intellectually sound or having a job or adding value to society is wrong run away that's not a man that's a boy he's dying of insecurity every man wants his girl to be intellectually sound powerful and very functional in society that's why all fathers train their daughters and they give them the best so you must grow from your value being your body to your value becoming your mind so study the best of courses get the best of jobs earn money for yourself it is part of your developmental process you should be able to stand somewhere address anybody anywhere in any forum you should be able to handle any position in society you should be a president because you have something unique that if you don't add to society society will be destroyed but you also need to grow from being a lady to becoming a wife that's why this scripture did not say women this scripture did not say girls this scripture did not say ladies it say wives because it's mindful that they are girls it's mindful that there are ladies but is referring to ladies that have become wives and while a girl's glory is her looks a lady's glory is her mind the glory of a wife is her submission so these are levels of development and then you will still grow from here to become a mother and the glory of a mother is sacrifice but the problem is that many women are girls at 30 they are girls at 40 so even while they are 35 they think it's by appearing naked that they have value so you see them on the streets everywhere trying to expose all their body because they have not built values they didn't migrate from a girl to a lady to a wife see when you are a girl and a lady you may not be very spiritual there's no problem but when you become a wife you must become a very spiritual woman because what defines you are ordinances of the kingdom and the major ordinance of the kingdom is submission and the same thing applies to men you have boys then you have young men then you have husbands then you have fathers a boy his glory is his strength that's why all of us sitting here when we were in our early teens we fought one two three person every day you go out to play either your face is swollen or your head is swollen 
no matter how spiritual you are, you must want to show your masculinity. Somebody speaks, you say, is it me you are talking to? No, I must get back to you. I must show that I'm a man. That's a boy. When you grow from there and you become a young man, you begin to think responsibilities. What do I need to do? You take responsibility for yourself and you take responsibility for others. That's what makes you a young man. That's the sign that you are growing. If everything about you is you feel fight, you can defend you, you, are, you are a boy. You need to grow to a level where you take responsibility. So somebody can offend you. Instead of fighting to show your masculinity, you take responsibility for peace. Because you have grown from a boy to a young man. And then you move from there, you become a husband. When you become a husband, you migrate from taking just responsibility to loving sacrificially. That's what God sees before he allows any of his daughters to be committed to you. But many times, God is telling his daughters, don't go there. That person is still a boy. But they say, no, I love his chest. God is saying, wait, wait, let him metamorphose. He has not become a husband. He is still a young man. He wants to prove that he's strong. So when you are quarreling, although you are the one who is right, he will slap you to keep quiet. Because he wants to show that he's a stronger person. So that's a boy in marriage. Because he's a boy and always wants to show his masculinity, he is self-centered. So he wants to take everything that you have, including your dignity. And he thinks it's by oppressing you that he shows that he's strong. So you can never have a reasonable conversation with him. His ego won't let him. He's a boy. You tell him the truth, he becomes angry for two weeks. And that anger is not anger. It's his ego trying to intimidate you. Because the only time he's comfortable around you is when you are like a, a fowl that is beating under the rain. He needs you to be fidgeting for him to show that he's a man. But he's a boy. He has not grown. But when he becomes a husband, everything about him is to love and care for you until he brings out the best in you. So when you want to marry, you need to discern what stage the brother is and what stage the sister is. If the sister is still a lady, leave her alone. You will marry a feminist. She will show you that authority means independence. She will destroy that home and she will not even have compassion. She will be so selfish, she won't even care about the children. As far as it's concerned, what makes her a woman is her independence. Because that's the level of maturity she has attained. Until you find a wife. That's why we don't find ladies. It's a he who finds a wife. A wife is one who understands that her strength is her submission. And a husband is not a man who is strong. A husband is not a man who has the capacity to take responsibility. A man can pay house rent. A man can buy cars, but he doesn't love you. He is still very selfish and self-centered. Everything he's buying is to show you that he has arrived. So he has five cars. It's not because he needs them. He, he, he just wants his ego that is driving him. And he will see you. He will touch you a car. He doesn't love you. He wants everybody to know that the lady he's dating is driving a jeep that he bought for her. So it's about he, he. The day you touch his ego, you will know that he doesn't care about you. So you must make sure the person you are going into a relationship with is a husband. The word husband means gardener. It's somebody who can care for the flower, nurture the flower until he brings it out. It's when wife and husband find themselves that marriage can take place. And that's what this scripture is showing us. It said wives... Not ladies, not girls, not women, wives. He says, submit to your husband. Because it is wives we find. It's not ladies we find. Many are looking for ladies. Many are looking for girls. If you find a wife, he says, you have found a good thing. You have obtained favor from the Lord. And if you have found a wife, it's now giving wives instruction. Ephesians 5 verse 22. Or let's do 23. He says, submit yourselves unto your own husband. Hope you are seeing this scripture. He didn't say submit to men. Because many persons try to control women. And they say, no, women are nothing in society. They are beneath men. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible didn't say women are not anything in society. The Bible didn't say women should submit to men. It said, wives, submit to your own husband. 
follow the Bible. If you want another person's wife to submit to you, you are looking for trouble. If a woman is your boss in the office and you show up with your traditional mentality and say, I'm a man, you will be fired. There's no law anywhere that women submit to men. Wives submit to your own husband. It's Africa that wants to usurp authority over women and intimidate them. Don't carry African mentality into life. Follow scriptures. Verse 23. And you see the way he puts this. Ah, wait. He says, as unto the Lord. <laughs> if you see a man who you cannot submit to as Lord, please don't marry. These are the things they are not telling people. They are telling you, marry your friend. They are telling you, what was the quality of a communication like? You can communicate very well. I saw a clip recently. They went to the altar. And when the priest was reading, he now read, and I will submit to him as Lord. The lady said, come on. We didn't discuss that before now. We didn't discuss. What? What? No, no, no. We, 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 we've got to look at this. We've got to reveal this. What do you mean? They are reading Bible. How did you come here? He said, no, 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 no. Because submitting as unto the Lord means everything about you is permitted. Your body, your name, your money. There are many people who think, well, they can submit their body, but they, they can't submit their name. Some think they can't submit their money. It's only a harlot that gives her body for money. If you can give your money, your body, then you don't own any other thing that you can't submit. And in case you don't understand the context, he said, whatever you consider submitting to the Lord to be, he said, translate the same to your husband. So God will judge the quality of your submission to him in the quality of your submission to your husband. You can quote 1,000 scripture about submission. The way God will check if you have understood submission as a wife is the way you submit to your husband. Because he said, the way you submit to the Lord, he said, that's how you submit to your husband. Let's go to the next verse. And I will show you why the Bible puts it like this. And that's where the mystery is. He said, for husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church and the savior of the body. And I will talk about the savior aspect. That's where the sacrifice of the man comes in. He said, the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church so anything the church cannot do to Jesus the wife can't do to the husband so your Christianity is fake if you don't know how to submit to your husband if you can't submit to your husband well it means you are a bad Christian because you can't submit to Jesus this is what scripture is teaching and these are the things we don't want to share now you come, people tell you submission is mutual. Says who? Says who? Is, is Christ submitted to the church? How, what makes submission mutual? He say, wife, submit to your husband as Christ, as the church is submitted to Christ. Is Christ submitted to the church? So what makes it mutual? He say, your husband is your head, as Christ is the head of the church. Is there a mutual submission between the church and Christ? What are we teaching? Because we want to be politically correct. And so we can't teach Bible. That's why I told you, we speak what? Mystery amongst them that are mature. Not the wisdom of this world, but the wisdom that is from above. I read this kind of scripture so that most young people who hear me before you go into marriage be careful make sure the man you are going after or you want to accept is like christ because when you marry him the bible insists that you must submit to him like christ so if the man is not like christ don't marry him because you will submit to him like christ that's what they are not being taught go to the next verse he said, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, he says, so let the wives be.
be to their own husband in everything that concerns you. He says, as Christ is subject to the husband, he says, so let the wives be subject to their own husband. If you look at this, you will think God is being harsh with women. But I'll talk about the man too. So don't worry, follow me. Next verse. Husbands, he has come to men. He said, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So this kind of love is not just to buy toy or buy things. It's the way Christ loved the church. That's why you need to be helped to be a husband. The same way you need to be helped to be a wife. You will think. Now, when you look at the church and you look at Christ, which one has a possibility or margin for error? Is the church. That means if a woman errs, her error can be forgiven. But if a man errs, there will be consequences. So this law is harder for the man. If you don't love your wife as Christ loved the church, you will be in trouble. And I will show you the trouble. When he met the woman, he didn't say, if you don't submit to your wife, your husband, God will do something. But when he came to the man, he said, if you don't love your wife, he gave two conditions that I will show you. Number one, he said the man will be considered an infidel. That means God can disqualify that man's Christianity if he doesn't relate with his wife in love. And number two, he said your prayers will not be answered. So a man can walk under closed heaven just because he didn't genuinely love his wife. And when I was reading this, I said, ah, why didn't you also say if the woman does not, if the wife does not submit to the husband, she will be an infidel? Why didn't you say if the wife does not submit to the husband, her prayer will not be answered? That means a woman can offend the husband and go and meet God and say, forgive me. Please help me. I will repent. But if a man does not love his wife and he goes to God, even the forgive me will not be heard. He will go to the wife first and make peace. Because God said the woman is the weaker vessel. So he expects more from the man in this context. So if you want to love a woman or you want to marry a woman, make sure you are ready to die for her. He didn't say the woman should die for the husband. He said the husband... <laughs> this is why most times it's men that die for love. So, don't tell any woman. If any man comes to you and say, I want to marry you, ask him, can you die for me? Before you bring flowers here, flower can be bought for 150 naira. They sell flower for 300 naira. Can you die for me? If he says yes, check his ego first. If he can't give up his ego for you, he can't die for you. And many women today are suffering because they married men who don't love them. Because love in this context is not emotion, it's sacrifice, it's self-denial, it's death. Next verse. It said that you might sanctify and cleanse with water by the washing of the water. So, see what God is saying here. It's the responsibility of the man to cultivate the woman who that means if the woman errs, God will still look at the man and say, why are you not teaching your wife? Before God blames the woman, he will come to the man, you are failing. He say, cleanse her by washing with water by the word of God. The word, word there is the word remata. So the way you hear the rema word and you are transformed, it says the duty of the man to teach the woman the word of God until she is converted. So if a woman chooses to be unsubmissive, the man doesn't have the right to be angry. It's a calling to teaching. So your wife can disobey you. Your wife can be rebellious to you. You will want to fight. You will hold yourself. Because Christ didn't slap the church when the church erred. Christ doesn't kick the church when the church errs. Christ doesn't, doesn't bite the church. If the church errs, Christ will send prophet. Christ will send apostle. Christ will send Holy Ghost. By all means to help the church. So any, the, any deficiency in your wife is a calling to teaching. So when you find men who are quick to accuse their wives, it's because they don't know that they are gardeners. You don't have the right to accuse your wife. 
you don't have the right to hit your wife the only thing you do is that you keep washing her with the word so anything you see in your wife that is wrong is a new responsibility for you if your wife is selfish with money you go and gather all the scripture about money and you use all the wisdom there is to teach her why she needs to submit it if your wife is disrespectful you go and gather all the scripture on how to show respect you will teach her the day she learns it that's the day you start enjoying if she doesn't learn it you are on a yoke to keep teaching that's why you can't marry a woman that has a big booboo talks you will marry a woman that is a wife if she ends up having a shape that is fine you can't marry a woman that has a big breast you can't marry a woman that has a big leg if she is a wife and she has them that's good but in case she doesn't have them and that's who God tells you you will have to learn to accept the will of God and tell God to help your carnality because hand is hand leg is leg everything is everything it's your carnality I will show you a third thing don't worry I'm joining but and I'm not saying what you like is not important God respects what you like if it is not in conflict with his will the only time what you like becomes a challenge is when it's in conflict with God's will so you have to submit what you like hope you get the point so I'm not saying don't just go and marry anybody because there are some people now they want to show you that they are super spiritual it's not even God that is bearing witness they just go and carry somebody to show people that they are kingdom people that's not what I'm saying if you do it by your flesh you will suffer God knows what you like God knows what is good for you he is not trying to punish you through marriage but we are spelling out this truth the way it is so that in case it's not consistent with what your carnality is suggesting you will have more honor for God's will. That's why we are saying it. Hope the point is clear. So a man who wants to marry must love the woman enough to die for her. That means every selfish man is not qualified to marry. Do you get the point? So this is how oneness is achieved. Oneness is not achieved because you have lived together for 10 years. Oneness is not achieved because you communicate every day. You can communicate out of unsubmission. You can communicate out of selfishness. So the key is not primarily communication. The key is to reset yourself first. As a wife, become submissive. That's when your communication can add value to the relationship. And as a husband, become selfishly loving before your communication can help. Because a selfish man and an unsubmissive wife can communicate for 20 years. Their communication will lead to greater violence. In fact, that communication can make the man slap the woman. So before you advocate for communication, make sure they understand these truths and they have submitted themselves to it. That a woman marries a man that she knows any day, any time, she will honor, respect and submit to. And a man marries a woman that he knows he's willing to die for. These are the two combinations that can achieve oneness. When they get here, he said the mystery of marriage is activated, which is the relationship between Christ and the church. This is what you call unconditional love. I'm not submitting to the man because he's nice. I'm not submitting to the man because he's wise. I'm submitting to the man because I have accepted him to be my husband. I'm not loving the woman because she's the best of human beings. I'm not loving the woman because she's the kindest of people. I'm loving her because I have chosen by the witness of the spirit that this is my wife. Now, the beautiful thing is that is as you are doing your own part that the person is becoming better. When the wife is submitting, her submission will now teach the man the ways of God. When the one man is loving, his loving will now convict the woman and teach her the ways of God. What the natural man wants to do is that they wait and correct everything before they are able to. So you love a man who is lovable or you submit to a man who is lovable and you love a woman who is lovable. That's not what the Bible says. 
a wife is an office a husband is an office your duty as a husband is to love unconditionally your duty as a wife is to submit unconditionally and as you are doing it you now allow god to walk on both of you when you submit to the man the holy ghost can talk to the man when you love the woman the holy ghost can talk to the woman there are many men today when if their wives don't submit to them they will cut off money for upkeep they will collect every gift they've given her they will start punishing her so that when they intimidate her enough she will submit those are not husbands it is when she didn't submit that you will love more it is in that your love that she can be convicted and there are many women if their husbands are not doing what they think they should do even their bodies they withhold and they they, they lock up and they are looking at him i thought you say you are a strong man i'm not around and then the devil will now enter this thing is not designed to be conditional it's unconditional that's why you have to think well before you step in if a man does not love his wife unconditionally his prayers will not be answered he will be considered an infidel if a woman does not submit to his husband unconditionally she is not a wife and so that marriage can never become god's standard and there can never be oneness now why is oneness so important because it is in oneness that the secret of the power of god lies in genesis chapter 1 verse 1 he said in the beginning elohim created the heavens and the earth the first time god was introduced he was introduced by two factors the first factor of his introduction is a mystery that there is plurality in unity the second thing about this introduction is that he is all powerful because the word elohim means all powerful so all powerful is connected to the mystery of oneness so the reason god is all powerful is because god is a a trinity that mystery cannot be understood and because that mystery cannot be understood the secret of his power cannot be traced this is why every time god wants to give absolute power he doesn't give one man he give a unity of people because there's something about unity the purity of power can be preserved if unity is achieved even we as individuals there is nobody who can be anointed enough to represent the church he said wherever two or three are gathered together in my name he said dear i am in the midst of them in acts chapter 2 from verse 1 he said when the day of pentecost was fully come nothing happened until he said they were together in one accord immediately the power of the holy ghost fell upon them so when god is teaching us to submit and to love so that we become one is because the power we need for our home will come from there you cannot have power to secure your children in, in this unity this is why you find some children wake up they just run mad you get into some family strange afflictions just begin to happen demons come in and out as they will because the people through their division has opened the door to the devil the bible said a house divided against itself cannot stand because the power is in the oneness so the reason god insists on oneness is because there is a mystical power that operates wherever two or three becomes one and so god's idea of power should not begin in an organization it should begin in the marriage you know what it means if a marriage is right you can have all the encounters in your home if a marriage is right you can have all the healings in your home if the marriage is right all the demons can be cast away in your home the reason we are running pursuing apostles and prophets is because most of our challenges can be traced to the crisis in our home from high blood pressure that resulted in quarrel that resulted in intimidation to causes to insults that open gates to many demons if the, the demon comes to any family and sees that they are one he will run away quickly because number one he will waste his resources and number two they can shut down his program but when the demon comes into a home that they are not one he will invite other demons to come this is a place where our program can prosper because there is no oneness and so most people don't know that love in marriage is a responsibility not a feeling and that responsibility is because you need oneness to wield power and if you don't do this the day strange things begin to happen don't blame anybody you open the door 
God knows that the marriage institution will be attacked. So he created a system of power in that union. And that system of power is not primarily prayer. It's not primarily fasting. It's primarily unity of purpose that is born in oneness. It is when you are one that your prayer is powerful. It's when you are one that your fasting is powerful. It's when you are one that you can change your world. It is when you are one that you can raise children that can bear their ordinations. But today, many children that should have changed this world have become the problem of this world because they came out of divided homes. And parents are too selfish. So selfish that they don't care about their children. How can a man kick a woman out of the house knowing fully well that the child needs the mother's impute to become what it should be? How can a woman walk out of a relationship knowing fully well that the children need her? And in certain cases, it's not because there are uncontrollable issues. It's because of selfishness. She can't submit and the man cannot love. So every day the man is beating the woman, she has no choice but to leave. Or every day the woman is disrespecting, insulting and accusing the man until the home becomes hell. It would have been better for him to live on the rooftop than to share a night with her. And then you see marriages disintegrate because people don't take the responsibility of love. If we want to see the second mystery of marriage, which is absolute power, we must pay the price of submission and unconditional sacrifice because it is only on that premise that we can become one and when we become one then we can see power the third mystery of marriage is the fact that marriage is a school it's a school of the spirit and what God achieves in this school is to bring conformity to the image of Christ in the context of marriage God helps everyone to attain the full scope of the image of Christ. I'm, I'm preaching to you as an apostle. This is a marriage seminar. I'm just talking to you like a lecture. I can switch this service to a revival service. Because I have an anointing for doing it. I can switch this service to a miracle service. I can change anything now by the help of the Holy Ghost. This place can go on fire in less than two minutes. Because that's part of ordination. But you see, you will walk out of this place and say, this is a man of God. You know why? You know the anointing, you don't know the man. Because you don't live with me. And so, the witness that the Holy Ghost will bear and respond to is not your witness. If my wife looks at me and say, you are fake. <laughs> It will take a lifetime for me to prove that I'm not. You know why? Because it's either she's angry and wants to destroy me or because she's saying the absolute truth. Because she knows me. She knows me when nobody is there. She knows me when nobody or where nobody can know. And so, most times, God brings us into marriage. So he... He sticks us to another individual who will become like a checker and a quality control agent. So you can go and preach powerfully. Your wife will come back and tell you that you said when you were saying this, it's not God that was speaking. It's this thing that happened. It's this thing that happened. It's not good. In fact, many times when the Holy Ghost wants to bear witness to you, he will bear witness to your wife too. Because she is too close to you for you to pretend around her. You can, I can come for this meeting. I didn't pray. I didn't fast. But I will enter and walk like this. I, I, I see the, the hand of God is heavy on me. And I will start crying. I will start crying. I want to look at me and say, ah. But you know the one just in a moment ago. Why not just preach and go? Must you show the people that you are spiritual? If she says it. I can't deny it. Because me and her know it's true. Because she was with me from the bedroom when we came out. You didn't go to the bedroom. So you didn't know. So many times when God wants to cheat to you and shape you sincerely, he will put a spiritual person as your spouse. And many times what God does, hope you know that when you get married to somebody, suddenly they become bold. Even your disciples. Your disciples that used to call you Papa, Papa, 
clean your shoe and cook for you. When you get married, she will now say, honey, how are you doing? Have you eaten? You are going out, you say, "Eh, uh-huh, please bring that uh, phone on the table. Uh-uh. Bring phone. Okay, no, no, no problem. You will think maybe uh, she's tired. You are going out. Please, when you are coming, buy this, buy this, buy that. You will now tell yourself that this matter now is not a first one disciple again. This matter is husband and wife. She will become so bold. Even you who was her teacher, you will say some things. You say, this thing you said, is it the Holy Ghost that told you? You will now say, ah, are you now more discerning than me? She will say, no, it's not about discernment. Because I think, ah, ah, it's marriage. It's marriage. It's marriage. I will preach. People will say fire, fire, fire. Sometimes I say something, my wife, my wife will look at me and say, This one is pride. I will turn and look at her. How dare you say this thing is pride? And it's my his wife that dare me. Wife has given me audacity. And then sometimes you want to react, but you know it's true. So what I do is that I will brush my beard and say and go away. I have the right to go away. After some time, you will come back and know it's true. When next you want to talk like that, you will remember her voice. This is pride. So you will couple yourself together and say, Lord, help me, help me, help me in this area. What she's doing is that God is using her to shape you. That's why the Bible said concerning the husband to the wife, it said that thou mightest cleanse her. God knows that she has many pastors. She has many mentors. She has many teachers. But he said that thou, you the husband, that thou mightest cleanse her by washing with the Holy Ghost is a helper. That's how the wife is your helper. So she will shape you. There are many truths your disciples will be afraid to tell you. She will tell you. And there are many advices that nobody knows you enough to tell you. She will tell you. I can't tell you how many advices my wife has given me that nobody even knew I needed. Because everybody sees you under the anointing. They say, Come, this man is wise. Imagine the wisdom of God that he's talking about. But there are many areas of foolishness that nobody knows. Your wife will sit down and say, No, do like this, do like this, do like most of our counsels at home are touching finances. They come from her. Because I'm a man of faith. Give me all, I will spend all now for kingdom now. Because tomorrow we take care of itself. Take no thought about tomorrow. <laughs> take no thought. Tomorrow we take care of yourself. So anything that comes, we say, what is next? They need drum, buy drum. You need screen, buy screen. There's crusade. How many crusades? Take, take. The whole money we finish. God will bring tomorrow. We say, no. No. God needs to see how careful you are so that he can give more. So what we'll do is put this portion here. Let's not touch it. If we don't touch it, we will not die. Nobody will know that. Only her can tell you that. And as you are doing it, you'll see that your life begins to blossom. You are becoming more like Jesus. Areas of your pride that nobody knows. Because everybody is calling you Papa, Apostle, Man of God. Even when you are wrong, they, they hold, the correction they should give you, they, they put it in form of suggestion. And maybe they put it three days later. You can't even connect it to the arrogance you demonstrated yesterday. If this thing was like this, Apostle, I don't know, but I'm just perceiving. No, they are not perceiving. They are telling you that you are arrogant and you are behaving foolish. So do it like this. But your wife can tell you. It will pain you at first. It will pain you. After a while, the Holy Ghost will now tell you that she's helping you. And so, the more you submit and the more you love, the more you start becoming like Jesus Christ. The more you start becoming like Jesus Christ. The more you start becoming like Jesus. Somebody called me the other day and was trying to tell me some things that I should be careful about. I said, no. I receive it by inspiration. That's how I say it. You don't tell me about it. But my wife came back and said, in this season, she touched some sensitive things. I went back. The Holy Ghost said, yes. Did you not read about Abraham? When Sarah spoke, Abraham wanted to argue. God said, go and do as your wives have said. Because God put them around you to shape you. The same way God put your husband around you to also shape you. So it's a school of the spirit. I was teaching them somewhere about submission. I said, 
One of the reasons why God insists on submission is because even angels are learning from marriages. We are not only teaching men, we are also teaching angels. If you study 1 Corinthians 11 verse 6, it says, let a woman cover her head. Talking about staying under authority, it says, because of the angels. Because there was a principality that mentored one third of the angels in error. And since that time, angels have not been taught submission. And God was looking for teachers to teach them. So one of the reasons he instituted marriage is so that as the woman is operating under submission, the angels will be learning. They will be learning. He said, put cover your head all the time. He said, because of the angels. It's a school of the spirit. And God gave man authority over women. But he said, don't kill them. Don't kill your wife. He said, rather, the way you show that authority is to die. Because Jesus was the first person that mentored us in that order of authority. That the way you show power is by dying. So instead of showing your wife that you are stronger, you accept the place of weakness. So you are dying. And the angels are looking at you. Ah, we thought the way you exercise authority is to exert dominion. You say no. Some dominions are exerted by dying. So our activities, our action with one another is a teaching for ourselves to become like Christ. And it's also a tutor and a teaching syllabus to a generation and even to angelic beings. So when a woman stays under authority, they say angels are learning. They now see the reason why Lucifer was foolish when he rebelled against God. Because your glory manifests when you submit. That's why I say for the woman, her beauty is not in her apparels. They say her beauty is patterned after the ordinances of a quiet and a meek spirit. It's in her submission that she glows. It's not in showing that she can talk. It's not in showing that she has authority. It's not in showing that she can be independent. And when it came to the man, he said the honor of a man is not shown because he wants to exercise authority. The honor of a man is showing in his selflessness and his sacrifice. When a man becomes vulnerable to his wife, a woman who is God-fearing, that's the more she will submit. Because the thing will make her uncomfortable. That's how these systems are designed. It's a school of the spirit. So be mindful when you are dealing with a spouse or when you want to choose a spouse that God will use that spouse as a chisel of bringing out Christ in you. It's not just about emotion. Trust me, a day will come when emotion will not count. But this training of Christ-likeness, you will need it even in eternity. When you become 50, when you become 60, all of this, your body that is itching, you will know that there are hormones. And there are hormones that demons are are, are, are are staring up. When you become 70, all of those things will go down. That's when you will know that you need an understanding woman. You need an understanding man that can help you secure your place in eternity. Because how you live your life on earth is what will determine your reward in heaven. And so you need a helper. You need a companion that can bring out the tools of the spirit to shape out the flesh, the things of flesh that won't let you enter glory. And when you get to heaven, you will thank God that they were with you. Because the reason you had certain truths that made you adjust your life, which will make you inherit glory today, is because she was there. It's because he was there. Because they are teachers, both to themselves and to men and to angels. Marriage is a school of the spirit. Number four. As I'm trying to round up, my time is finished. Sometimes you can't emphasize these things enough. It's better taught in a series. If I was in a series, the first point I would have taught it and ascended and brought down the presence and leave you to interact with it, come back. But when things wanted to go up, I had to key the atmosphere so that I can keep saying these things. Because hear it, your spirit is receiving it. In the day that you need it, it will come out of your spirit. It is planted. Because you've given me your ears, I have the opportunity of planting into your heart. And I will plant this scripture so that it will be there. And if you are not yet married, please take these things with seriousness. Because this is the reality of marriage. Don't just marry somebody because you think you have emotions. Or because you, you think, no, be careful. That man that you are talking about, make sure he's like Christ. Because in marriage, God will see him as your Lord. And that woman that you are thinking is all about emotion. If she gets into marriage, she will become the basis by which your prayer ministry and your work with God will be vetted. 
You can be a mighty intercessor that has no answer from heaven. Because your wife provoked you and you behave with her like an animal. All your prayer enterprise will shut down. Because as far as God is concerned, your prayers will not be heard. So be careful before you dabble into a relationship. Marriage is worship. That's the fourth mystery of marriage. It's worship. Because many times, when you get into marriage, you will discover that most of the choices you will make, you will make because of God. Ask those who are married, they will tell you. When you want to marry, you will make choices because of the person. But when you get married, you will make choices because of God. Because you are not yet married, you can trek from Kubwa to Gwagwalada or trek from Kubwa to which other part of Abuja now? You can go to Zone 2 from Kubwa or Nyanya. Yes, you can trek from Kubwa to Nyanya to present a flower to the lady. In fact, as you are going, the energy is coming because you are, you are imagining her smiles and you are laughing. You are smiling. You can't you won't even feel that you have trekked for six hours. When 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 you come, you you may not even have the opportunity to see her yet. You will wait somewhere until she has the time, and then you come and say, With all my heart, I brought you this little token. When you get married, if you have to trek from Kuba here, unless God tells you. If there's need to trek, God, God will be the one to convict. You know what? All those things you were imagining, they will no longer be an imagination. And you now discover that life does not begin and end there. Because all you were seeing when you were trekking is to hug her. And you will hug her for 10 minutes. You will not feel the heat. You will not feel the, the pains of trekking. Welcome. When you marry her, you will hug her every day. You now discover that before you do anything, you must be a man of God. You must be a woman of God. Because a day will come when you will care for her as responsibility. You will love her as responsibility. Because feelings don't exist all the time. Feelings are not the way they... See, one of the greatest deceptions of your life that you can never do away with is your feelings. Feelings fluctuate. Age manipulates feelings. Events manipulate feelings. Even environment manipulate feelings. If you change environment, your feeling will change. If conversation changes, your feeling will change. If events change, your feeling will change. If your age change, your feelings will change. So you will discover if you will work with this person for a lifetime, most of the things that are right that you should do, you will keep doing it because of God. Now, because you are doing what you are doing because of God, marriage will become worship before God. So even when the person does not deserve to be loved, you will still love her as a responsibility to God. When God begins to see that love, that love now is not just about affection anymore. It's worship. Your wife disobeys you. Your wife dishonors you. You still say, my dear, I love you. You are correcting her. She doesn't listen. You still keep your calm. It's not because you don't know how to argue. But it's because of God. God commanded that you should love. So from that day, that love will be greater than some of these songs we sing on the altar. You know, some songs we sing is talent. Real worship is submitting your will to the will of the Father. When Jesus knelt down in Gethsemane and said, not my will, but thine. That's the loudest sound of worship that heaven heard. That when a man can subjugate his own will for the will of God to find expression, is a high kind of worship in the spirit. And in marriage, there are many decisions you will make because of God. You will tell your husband something, he will not do it, he will violate it. Sometimes he even violates you. But you will look at him, you will still maintain peace in the home. That peace now becomes worship. It's no longer peace. The name in the spirit will no longer be peace. If you go, they will call it worship. So you may not be singing, but you become a great worshiper. Because when God sees it, did you hear what Paul said when he was teaching? He said, that attitude of a quiet spirit, of meekness, he said, it is great profit in the sight of God. So when you do what you need to do in marriage, because God commands it, even though your feeling is not dictating it, 
God sees it as a great prize in the spirit because it's an act of worship. So marriage affords us the opportunity to worship God at another level. I'm saying this because some of you, you have entered and the thing is not like you saw it from outside. Don't worry. Keep doing good. It's worshipable. That your husband that spoke with, with tongue like honey. Now, all you are hearing is quarrel. Don't change. Keep loving. I met a woman recently who is married for over 18 years. And for these 18 years of marriage, the husband is still a boy. If they have any little disagreement at home, for two weeks, the husband will come frowning. He won't laugh with anybody. He will intimidate them until they come and beg. And you will think when they beg, it will pacify the man. When they start begging, it's like he reminds him that he's king. He will now add fuel and extend the anger for another one week. And everybody will be fidgeting at home. When he sees that everybody is scared, he will now come home and smile with you and say, how are you? That how are you? He feels you should jump and say, thank you God. Hey, daddy have smiled today. Daddy is smiling and the whole house, everybody will be jubilating. Then he will say, it's okay, it's okay. And she has endured it for 18 years. You know why such person is still there? For two reasons. Number one, because of God. And number two, because of her children. That kind of act has endeared that woman to God. Much more than many people who are preaching. Because she has the heart of Christ. Much more than certain apostles and prophets. And so every time she endures it, she is worshipping God. And there are many men who married Jezebel. And they have also endured for 10 years, for 20 years. So long as your life is not threatened, so long as it's not violent, and you can still enjoy it, it's an act of worship. But God is not in, in, intending for us to endure. He wants us to enjoy it and leave it to the fool. But the point I'm making is, there are certain areas that while we are undergoing transformation, we will keep enduring. That endurance is because of God and God sees it as worship. This is one of the mystery of marriage. Now, because it is worship, it becomes a basis for you getting reward in heaven. So some people will not get reward in heaven only because they want souls. Some people will get reward in heaven because they made the marriage work. Because they stayed until the children became prophets. They became apostles. They became governors. They became presidents. So they stayed and played their part for the nation to be fulfilled. God sees it as an act of worship. Can we bow our heads and pray? Paul said marriage is a great mystery. It is something deeper than emotions. Emotions are a part of it, but it's deeper. Now there are two prayers we'll pray here tonight. Number one, is for God to give you the discernment to choose correctly. May you not choose because you felt something. I'm telling you the truth. May you not choose because you felt something. Choose because God witnessed to it that that is what he wants for you. You can build happiness. You can build understanding. You can build friendship. But make sure this person is God-fearing. Make sure this person is submitted to God. Make sure God himself gives you a witness that he has a hand in this thing. I saw a clip recently. A young lady got married to a man. Probably because he was throwing money everywhere. On the reception ground, the lady now started seeing what she never knew. Some people came carrying some idol kind of stuff and were shooting all kinds of things. The lady was, where am I? Who is this? She married money. Now she has seen the man behind the money. What she saw was a disguise. If she sought God, she would have known the right thing to do. I heard a story of a woman and we were able someone to pray for her. She married a young man who was doing very well. You know, in the moment you have car, you have money, they say you are doing well. We have to redefine what it means to do well. Doing very well. And she married him. When they came back from honeymoon, the man held him by the hand and came and said, This room, don't ever enter. That's all. She wanted to say, and the man turned. The face she saw was a lion. 
she knew it to be an error to ask why and because they were not spiritual people they never had hands to pray together they never spoke about God they never spoke about kingdom the man will come today give hundred thousand come tomorrow give car she never really connected to the spirit of the man now the man turned and she saw the reality of the man fear hit her but you know men have curiosity one day the man was not around and she went to open the room she saw a bucket of blood that's how she started screaming and became mad from there they had to invoke intercessors to pray she will recover after one month the thing will come to her again she will start we labored at that time that was the stature we had based on our revelation we labored and we got tired and left some people were laboring i i hope she was delivered but even if she is how will she go back to that house you know what she will have to start trusting god to live her life afresh because she took for granted matters that have their roots in the spirit if you have not yet married one prayer you pray tonight is lord give me the power of god has moved here mightily already so i'm not even attempting to do anything ask god grant me discernment to see how you see and also grant me the fortitude to marry not according to my carnality but according to your will that's the first prayer pray Now, I need you to understand this prayer. I'm not saying go and break any relationship you are into. And I'm not saying it's wrong to marry somebody you love. You know, I preached before, I said, don't marry who you love. Love who you marry. One elder called me and said, I should explain the statement further so that people will understand exactly. And elders have more wisdom. So I, I want to leave this disclaimer. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if you love him, make sure he's the will of God. Don't just love him just because you love him. Do you understand? So ask God to help you to discern him, to discern him as the will of God for you. Or to discern her as the will of God for you. Can you say that prayer? Help me. Jesus, I am your, I am your own. of us who are married, there's one prayer. Father, give my spouse the encounter he or she needs to become your ideal person. Give him or her that encounter. Anybody can become anything if you will have an encounter. Give him that encounter. Can we lift our hands right hand and pray that prayer now? Even me who is teaching you now, I still need many encounters to become who I ought to be. Ask him for that. I wanted to talk about was priesthood. 
that marriage is priesthood. But we don't have time. God will give us understanding. You know, when I started talking, I saw that many persons became quickly excited. So I had to tune down. So that I say some things. Because they are being recorded. People will hear it even from now, after now. So it's not just about the atmosphere. It's about the truth. I want to pray for someone. And there are two prayers I want to pray now. Number one, everyone who is here, who is due for marriage, that before this year is over, God will connect you profitably and set you on course for marriage. And number two, everybody who is already married, that God will give you marital bliss. You will not endure it, you will enjoy it. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for bringing us here. You gathered us here because you had a purpose for marriage. And so in the name of Jesus, I pray, everyone who is here, who is yet to marry, but whom season has come, let the door of marriage open to that one. And because of this meeting, let many testify. In the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray for everyone who is already married. The encounters needed to make them the ideal partner. Grant that encounter in the name of Jesus Christ. Make us husbands indeed. And make our wives wives indeed. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you Father because you will begin a new thing. And your name alone will be glorified. In Jesus' precious name we have declared. Thank you so much. God bless you. We believe you've been blessed by this sermon. For inquiries, please call plus 233-267676055. Plus 233-267676055. Or send an email to info at godswordforus.com. Info at godswordforus.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah.